All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Mindful Hunter. I'm your host as always, Jay Nickel. And today we have what is arguably the most complicated review I have ever done. We are going to look at six pairs of range finding binoculars. That's the Vortex Fury, the Zeiss Victory RF, the Leica Geovid 3200.coms, SIG 3K, SIG 10K, and the new Revic BLR. We're gonna assess these binoculars across five classes. Descriptive, construction, optics, viewing performance, and range finding. And across those five classes, we are gonna look at 25 different categories. Those being price, weight, length, origin, warranty, weather resistance, frame material, ergonomics, field of view, glass quality, glass coatings, image crispness, low light performance, edge to edge clarity, chromatic aberration, focus, eye box, user interface, integration, responsiveness, accuracy, max range, and ballistic features. When we've done all that, I'm gonna score each of the binoculars across all 25 categories and we're gonna come up with a winner. And here's what everybody is gonna be excited to know. As usual, we are going to raffle off the best binocular of the bunch. If you wanna participate in that raffle, go to mindful-reviews.com. All of the information for the raffle will be on that site. You need to be a member to participate. So if you're already a member, you've already been notified that the raffle is live. If you're not, you can join up on that site and then you'll be given instant access to where you can buy raffle tickets. Now, please look at the information on that site and look at the information in the description below this video. As soon as this raffle sells out, I will update information in both of those places. We're gonna do a fairly limited raffle. I wanna start doing more products, so I'm gonna keep the ticket sizes a little bit smaller. So I'm only releasing 150 tickets at 25 USD per ticket. So if you wanna participate, mindful-reviews.com. Now, before we get into the guts of the review, I wanna give some context. This, as I already mentioned, was an incredibly complex review. In fact, I'm gonna say it's a little bit out of my pay grade. I think one of the factors that's always contributed to my success is my level of self-awareness around my strengths and my weaknesses. So I am not a die-hard long distance guy and I have a working knowledge of range finders, but I'm not up there with some of the other experts. So first and foremost, I need to give a shout out to Steve Evans. Steve is an absolute, not only just a stud of a killer, but he is a genius when it comes to this. And he, like me, likes buying gear and likes testing the shit out of gear. So he's run the majority of these binos for long periods of time. And when I was like running into walls or couldn't figure something out or needed some feedback from a second set of eyes, he gave me an extensive amount of help on this review. So first and foremost, I wanna give Steve some credit. I really appreciate all the help you did. Secondly, I am gonna do my best to be as accurate and precise with all of the information presented here today, but there is way too much to go over in each one of these binoculars for me to dive deep into the guts of every single one. So if I gloss over something that you want more information on, I would recommend looking for an in-depth review on that specific binocular. And if I do make an error, it was simply a, a mistake on, on my part. And if you notice something that you disagree with, or even something that you can just add some clarification to, where maybe the assumption I came to, I was on the right track, but you can kind of bring me and the audience a little further and add some additional clarity, please jump into the comments section below. I'd like to have this be an ongoing conversation. Further to that, I already have multiple podcasts lined up with ballistics experts, bullet experts, uh, ranging experts, and we are gonna start to dive in because this brought up so many interesting topics for me, like things that I was not deeply aware of or things that I didn't know I even needed to brush up on. And so I've become really curious about a bunch of different elements now of, of range finding binoculars. So if there's more information that you want, please let me know because I'm searching out experts in all of these various fields so that we can educate ourselves more. Now, the last note that I want to give on range finding binoculars before we get into this review is that 
I think many people like myself used to think range finding binoculars, although expensive, were this really ideal do it all solution. And the one thing that I learned throughout this review is that you are making a compromise when you buy range finding binoculars. There is no perfect range finding binocular on the market. Like there's nothing with like NL pure optics and ultimate top of the line ranging capabilities. Like it's just A, it is likely impossible to manufacture and I'll get into some of the reasons why and B, it would be prohibitively expensive. So what you need to understand is that no matter what range finding binocular you go with, you're going to be making a compromise. That compromise have, might have to do with ballistics. The compromise might have to do with glass quality or coatings, might have to do with user interface. So I'm telling you right now, there is no one perfect range finding binocular. What I can tell you though, is that after working with these binoculars for the last two months, I feel very strongly about the one that won. Sometimes when I get to the end of a review, like I can remember looking at a Kawa and Swarovski spotter. And by the end of the review, it was really like, listen, man, it kind of pick your poison. I would be happy to go into the field with either of those. You know, the Swaro does some things better. The Kawa does other things better. But in this review, I really firmly believe that the one that came out on top is today the best option. And that's the other thing to keep in mind. Range finding binoculars are so heavily influenced by technology, the field is developing rapidly. In fact, between the time I started this review and the time I finished this review, there were three or four products released at SHOT that made a significant splash in this space that I think might have mixed up the results of this particular review. All right, I'm gonna try and keep the pace rather quick. So again, if you want clarification on anything else, drop it in the comments section below and I will get into it. Without further ado, let's get into the nuts and bolts of the review. So first category is price. I'm gonna run these from the least expensive to the most expensive. All prices are in USD. SIG 3K, 800, Vortex Fury, 1500, Leica GeoVid, 2500, SIG 10K, 2500, Revic, 2695, Zeiss Victory, 4K. Again, all in USD. And you can see we kind of have three different categories. We have what I would call the budget-friendly options, that's gonna be your SIG 3K and your Vortex Fury at 800 and 1500. Then we have your middle of the road options, the GeoVids, the 10K and the Revic at basically 25, 2600 bucks. And then we have the Zeiss way at the upper end at four grand. Now, the other binocular that belongs up there is the Swaro EL Range TA. A lot of people are gonna say, why is it not here? just a practical challenge of trying to do reviews. I don't, other than Gunworks, Gunworks was willing to send me these. I made a post on Instagram that I wanted to do a range finding binocular review and without any you know, persuasion on my part, they didn't make me agree to anything. They literally just said, send us your address and we'll send you a pair to review. Send them back when you're done. That speaks very highly for me to the confidence that they have in this particular product. But none of the rest of these, these are all friends binoculars that they were willing to lend me. Optics are extremely challenging to get. And the bottom line is I just couldn't put my hands on a pair of Swaro EL range. Now, I have spoken with several people who have run the Swaro EL range. And when we get to the conclusion at the end, I will kind of give you my best guess based on anecdotal evidence where I think the Swaro EL range sit. I can tell you right now, in my opinion, they do not displace the winner. Okay, moving on to weight, SIG 3K, 31 ounces, Revix 31.75, SIG 10K, 32, Vortex Fury, 32.4, Zeiss Victory, 33.9, and the Leica GeoVids at 34.5. And before I get into my thoughts on that, I'm gonna do length real quick because I think weight and length are very strongly correlated. So 
All of these are in inches. Obviously, all of the previous weights were in ounces. Revix at 5.2, SIG 10K 5.7, SIG 3K 5.75, the Vortex Furies 5.8, the Zeiss 6.5, and the Leicas at 7.0. There are essentially two form factors here with these binoculars. We have the Zeiss and the Leica that I would say are your more classical alpha bino shape and size. You know, standard six to seven inches long. The rest of these have all moved to a more compact or stubby. They, they're all between 5.2 and 5.8 inches. So they are significantly shorter and the Revix being the shortest of the bunch. Now this first category descriptive is really, because for some people, like when I'm talking about spotters or when I'm talking about um, other pieces of gear, sometimes price and weight are the single biggest determining factors for people. So that's why I group these together. So if we go to this descriptive category totals, remember the Binocular that wins this category will be the cheapest, lightest option. It doesn't necessarily refer to the quality of the binocular itself. This is probably also a good time to give for me to give everybody a refresher on my scoring system. So I use a forced ranking scoring system. So we have six pairs of binoculars. So within each category, I assign a score of one through six. The best performing binocular in each category gets a one for first place and the worst performing bino in each category gets a six for last place. At the end of the review, the binocular with the lowest score wins. I do my best to stay away from ties, but some of them are unavoidable. So, Sig Kilo in first place, Revic in second, Sig 10K in third, Vortex Fury in fourth, and the Geovid in fifth with the Zeiss in sixth. And there's a pretty significant spread of points. You know, the SIG is way up in first place with five points, and that's a significant spread down to 16 points uh, with the RF. So keep that in mind. There is a big difference in price and weight be between these binoculars, which is not always the case. Like if you go look at an 85 millimeter spotter review, um, there could only be three or four ounces between the cheapest and the most expensive, for example. So it's not always the case that just because something is cheaper is lighter or vice versa. Okay, next up, we're going to look at the construction class. And the first category within this class is origin. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day. I said to them, if I was only allowed to have access to a single piece of information about a particular optic, I think the thing that tells me the most about the quality and reliability of an optic is, an, is the origin of manufacture. And I almost feel like the longer optics manufacturing has gone on, the more ingrained and the more reliable this has come. Now this is not a rule, but it's a good kind of general rule of thumb. Europe has the highest quality of manufacturing, kind of Germany and Austria first, and then you go down a little bit to Portugal, still very high. After that, you have Japan, and after that, you have China. And you have some other newer countries that are kind of, you know, Myanmar and other places that are kicking in. But generally speaking, Europe is best, Japan is second, China is third. And I, I, I can't even off the top of my head think of an optic, for example, that's made in China that beats one built in Europe. It just doesn't happen. So with that in mind, Coming in at first place is the Zeiss Victory made in Germany. Coming in at second place is the Leica Geovid, which is manufactured in Portugal. Now, tied for second place are the Revix, which, although manufactured in Myanmar, Gunworks actually does their QC back in the States. So I think this is one of the interesting things that more, it's like this hybrid approach that more companies are switching to because a lot of the manufacturing issues aren't even like there are you know um, defects across them all or it's a generally poor grade of construction 
what happens is the further down the origin chain you move, the higher likelihood you have of like one-off defects or really bad QC. So by Gunworks slash Revic, taking their QC back to the States and then shipping anything back that doesn't meet their requirements, they're also able to keep their software and technology in-house that way. It's not installed in Myanmar. The shell gets shipped back and then they load the chip and the software in the States. Because they've implemented that stringent hybrid QC process, I'm gonna give them a kind of matching score with Portugal. Because to be quite honest with you, like has never been perfect coming out of Portugal either. And then tied at third place are the two SIGs, which are made in China. And then Vortex, no one knows where Vortex is made anymore. And this is one of my huge points of frustration with Vortex. And this is not going to be a Vortex, Vortex bashing episode. I actually think the Furies fared pretty well in this, in this group of products. But you cannot find anywhere on Vortex's website, packaging, brochures, where they will openly admit where a product is made. The only statement I can get out of them is that we use a variety of manufacturers across a variety of countries to make all of our components that then could get manufactured in different places. And I think they've done this because they move manufacturing around a lot to wherever is cheapest. And I think this has been one of the reasons for the you know decline in quality over the years. If you look at the original razors, the binos, those were made in Japan. I had a pair of those original razors. They were actually really decent binos for the price. As soon as they moved the razor manufacturing from Japan to China, QC you know, fell in the toilet and way more complaints about razor quality started cropping up. So I think in their effort to optimize their logistics, they've taken a hit to quality and you can reference that. It's like, well, why wouldn't you just tell us where they're made if they were all made in one place, but they're not. And I think that also influences quality. However, it doesn't get much worse than the China where the SIGs are made. So all three of those companies are going to tie third place. Next, we're going to move on to warranty. I'll do my best to keep this as simple as possible. So coming in at first place is no surprise, uh, the Vortex product. Vortex is the only one of these binoculars to not only give you a lifetime warranty on the optics, but a lifetime warranty on the electronic components inside. So if that's something that's important to you guys, recognize that right out of the gate, they're the only ones to do that. In second place, we have the Leica Geovid. So they will give you a lifetime limited warranty on um, manufacturing defects, but they will give you a 10 year no fault warranty. And it covers everything within the binocular. Coming in at third place is the Zeiss Victory RF. Now they also give you a lifetime limited, but you get a five year no fault with the Zeiss RF and they will cover everything inside the binocular. Now, when we move to the SIGs, you get an unconditional lifetime warranty on the housing and the optics, but you only get a five year limited warranty on the electronic components inside. Now, the Revix technically have the worst warranty of all of these binoculars. It's stated as a five-year limited or five-year discretionary warranty. So there's actually no firm language that completely protects you even within that first five years. So it is essentially, unless it's a clear manufacturer defect, um, anything, any accidental you know, um, damage or problem with the electronic components is going to be at the sole discretion of them if they want to fix it for you. Now, I haven't heard a whole lot of people complaining. I would assume, especially given how new the brand is, it's in their best interest to have, you know, brand sentiment be high and fix people's stuff for them as required. But I think it's very important to know that when you look at the black and white lettering of the warranty, it's a five-year limited, five-year discretionary. So there's a lot of wiggle room for them to get out of repairs if they want to use it. Weather resistance. Now, this one was an absolute shocker. 
So everybody kind of does this differently. Some people publish it in MBAR of resistance. Some people use the IP or ingress protection scale. And some people, as we'll, we'll see, don't publish any information at all. So coming in at first place is the Leica Geovid, which are rated to a submersion depth of five meters, which is incredibly high. And then tied for second place, we have the Zeiss Victory RF, which has a submersion depth of 100 millibar or one meter. And then the Revic Acuras um, have an IP rating of 6.7. Now I wanna give Revic a bit of credit here because ingress protection is made up of two numbers. The first number is solids and the second number is liquid. So all the six refers to the size of dust particle and the seven refers to the size of water particle. Now IP67 would be considered mil spec. In my opinion, anything that's gonna be used in outdoor environments, whether it's like radios or watches or any of that kind of stuff, the bare minimum should be IP67. And there's a lot here that are significantly worse than that. I'll get into the IP ratings after I discuss the rest of the binoculars. So um, tied for third place are gonna be the two SIGs and the Vortex. So the SIGs were originally unpublished, but I phoned and talked to tech support and they got in touch with one of the engineers and they told me that on both these binoculars, the ingress protection for water is four. So it's IPX4. They do not provide a rating for the solid ingress protection and the rating for the water is four. As usual, Vortex publishes no information at all. They say their binocular is waterproof, which is physically impossible. Uh, I've talked about this before. As soon as you have moving parts and seals and seams and screws and buttons and plastic, this is not waterproof. So I, I'm not even sure how legally they can say like they don't even say water resistant. They literally say waterproof and it drives me crazy. So here's what I'm gonna say. If the SIGs are willing to admit to an IPX4 rating, which in my opinion is terrible, no electronic component should have a rating of IPX4, the Vortex must be at least as bad or worse. So all three of those are gonna tie for four. Now, let me give you an example of the difference between an IP of four and an IP of seven. So an IPX4 would be splashing water in all directions. So I could like hold this, I could you know hold it above the bathtub and I could splash water on it from the bathtub and it would, it would withstand that and maintain its water resistance. Now we go up to a five, that's low pressure water jets from all angles. Then we go up to a six. Now that's high pressure water jets from all angles. When we get up to a seven, that's immersion to one meter, which is about three feet for 30 minutes. So you can see why, in my opinion, anything less than an IP of seven is unacceptable because you are not, these are not rated to be dunked underwater which means if you're crossing a creek and your binocular case goes underwater, I'm not saying it's guaranteed that there will be water damage, but they are not willing to say that it's guaranteed that there won't be water damage. When you get into the Revix, the Victories, and the Leica, you can take all of these, stick them in your bathtub for half an hour, pick them up, and they will work fine. Um, as long as there hasn't been any physical damage to the housing. This is an area I get particularly energetic about because I think it is an area where they cut costs. And I think with something as mission critical as the electronic components in a range finding binocular, this is not the time to have an IPX4 or an unrated IP. Okay, next we're gonna move on to frame material. This is one of the categories I'm kind of thinking of leaving out moving forward because everybody's really moving to the same materials. But it's interesting to note that all of these four binoculars have magnesium alloy, the two SIGs, the Leica, and the Victory. I couldn't actually find what frame material the Revix used. I saw on a third party site that they utilized aluminum but that wasn't verified by Revic, so I'm gonna give it second place just because I, I can't prove what it's made of. 
And then, as always, we got Vortex down in third place that refuses to publish any real technical information whatsoever about any of their products. Now, ergonomics is one of those things that, from a technical perspective, doesn't impact the performance of the product, but from a subjective perspective, it kind of is everything because how you interface with the product will dictate how much you like or enjoy um, the experience of working with the product. So coming in at first place, I got to give it to the Zeiss and the Leicas. Like when you pick up these binoculars, like I'm a big dude, I got big hands, my hands, they, they fit good on them. There's lots of like room. They have this beautiful rubber armor, nice big buttons, you know, really solid eye cups. No problem getting those in and out, like everything about both of these is just, it's just a pleasant viewing experience. The focus knobs are nice, particularly on the Zeiss. So they're coming in at first place. Tied in second place is gonna be the two SIGs. I really like the eye cups on these. Um, I will say in general, I was frustrated with the focus knobs on most of these, except for the Zeiss and the Leica. They are extremely tight and hard to move. And when you're doing something as delicate as trying to range a deer at 500 yards, having your binoculars shift all the time because you're having to exert so much force on the focus wheel is a little bit annoying. Now, down in third place, and the Vortex tied with the um, SIGs. Now, the only reason that I moved the Revix down to third place, and people who've watched a lot of my videos are gonna know this is one of my personal frustrations with Bino manufacturing. If we take a look at these eye cups, so that's fully depressed, that's fully elongated. Now, the problem is when I come all the way up like that, I only have to exert a little bit of pressure. These eye cups spin off really easy. Like you bring it all the way up and they just keep spinning. So what happens is you're constantly accidentally unscrewing your eye cups. And I don't understand, like the SIG 3K here, it's not an expensive binocular, it's $800. And they can devise a reliable eye cup mechanism that stays firm at the top. So it's one of those things I just don't have a lot of patience for. Like, come on, you know, there's no excuse. That that to me is just lazy engineering. I just gotta be honest with you. Like it shouldn't be that easy to unscrew. Every single time I bring these out, it unscrews on me. So they lose a point for that. So if we go over the category as a whole, now uh, this is trying to determine a ranking across several different categories as to the overall construction quality of the binocular. Of the Leica coming in at first place, the Zeiss Victory at second place, we have the Vortex Fury at third place, and then we have the two SIGs and the Revic tied for third place. And to be fair, there's only one point difference between the Vortex and the three in third place, the two SIGs and the Revix. So really tight category, you know, overall. Next, we're gonna move on to optic. I used to look at a lot more subcategories within this class, but I've kind of narrowed it down as I noticed there was such a strong correlation between the glass quality and the glass coatings that looking at 15 other things that kind of showed you the same stuff was really just a waste of time. So. Before we get into those, we're gonna look at field of view. So we can essentially break these up into two categories. We're going to have a tie between the Leica and the Zeiss. The Zeiss have a field of view at 1,000 yards of 345 feet, the Leica at 342. It's only three feet difference. We're not gonna kind of split hairs. And then when we go to the Vortex, the two SIGs and the Revix, uh, the, the last three have a view of 320 feet where the Vortex Fury is 321. So we're gonna give all those a tie. This is why there's such a strong correlation between like field of view and the quality of the optics. Like when you're looking at alpha glass manufacturers like Zeiss and Leica, and they have these longer bodies, you're gonna get 
the greater field of view. When you start going down to beta glass manufacturers like SIG, Revic, and Vortex, and they go to the shorter, more compact housing, you are gonna get that reduced field of view. I really feel from a glassing perspective, field of view is one of the most important characteristics of a binocular or any optic for that matter, because we notice things by movement. So the more area you can have under observation at a given time, the higher the statistical likelihood that you're gonna catch some kind of movement. Now, moving on to glass quality. So this is kind of tricky. I'm gonna break glass up into essentially three categories. High density, extra low dispersion, and some type of fluorite containing glass. And we could get into some subcategories there that would go all the way up to like a Kawa fluorite crystal. High density tends to be used in lower end optics. You move up a grade, you get extra low dispersion. You move up a grade, you start to get fluoride containing elements. So if we look at the ranking, Zeiss comes in in first place with uh, fluorite containing lens. I'm going to get into this more in a moment. The Leica Geovids are also kind of in that same category. The light transmission at 91%, which probably puts them, you know, somewhere between the Trinovids and the Noctivids, but not quite as good as the Noctivid. After that, we have the Revix, which use an ED glass. And then the SIGs don't provide any information whatsoever. Uh, so I'm just gonna assume they're using a high density glass and then Vortex specifically mentions using HD glass. Now this is one of the ones, one of the things I really wanna talk about. Even though, for example, this is called a Zeiss Victory RF, this does not have the same glass as a Zeiss Victory SF, which I find rather frustrating because you're, you're, you're saying it belongs in the Victory line and the Victory typically uses shot HT glass. If you look up a Victory Harpia on the Zeiss website, it will say shot HT, which stands for high transmission glass. If you look up the Zeiss Victory SFs, labeled very clearly shot HT glass. Like it's a premium product on their flagship line. They want you to know they use it. When you look these up, it just says FL for fluorite containing lenses, which does not necessarily mean it's using the shot HT glass. And that's what I was trying to allude to earlier in this review when I said like you're always gonna be making a compromise. So don't think you're gonna get, also we haven't even got into coatings yet, but that's gonna impact your viewing experience heavily. But don't think just because you have a Leica binocular or a Zeiss binocular that you're getting the same glass inside the range finding binocular that you're getting inside the alpha counterpart. That brings us on to glass coatings. So the first thing I wanna clear up here is that all of these range finding binoculars need to have a special coating on them so that you can see the OLED or whatever, you know, heads up display technology that each of these uses. That coating itself degrades optical quality to some degree. I can't put a percentage on it, but it is there for sure. And I can't find as much information on this topic as I would like, but I do feel like there must be other reasons why they're not using their top of the line alpha glass, whether the lasers themselves don't operate as well within that medium, I don't know. But just recognize that the Swaro EL range are the exact same way. That if, when you look at the EL range and the ELs side by side, the ELs are notably a superior viewing performance. Now, some of the coatings on these are atrocious. I don't know if anybody listening to this or watching this has ever looked through a pair of SIG 10Ks. In my opinion, this is an unusable binocular. It's literally like, you remember those old 3D glasses where you had like a blue lens and a red lens? This is like putting on those with two blue lenses. It is the bluest. I like It almost looks cartoonish to me. And the thing is, I remember going out to do one of my sessions where I was like testing everything side by side and I picked up the SIG 10Ks first. And I was using them for like 10 or 15 minutes and it, nothing even really jumped out at me. I was like, okay, that was interesting. I put them down and picked up another pair of binoculars and I was instantly like, wait a minute, what just happened? And so 
I went back and forth between the two and it was only by doing a comparative analysis that I was able, that my eyes were like, holy shit, man. This is the bluest blue tint I have ever seen on a pair of binoculars in my life. And this is another reason why a comparative review is absolutely necessary when you're looking at products like this. Because when you look at something in isolation, like I guarantee there are SIG 10K owners out there who would swear up and down that there's no tint in their binoculars. And it's because you've never looked at your binoculars side by side with another pair of binoculars and gone back and forth. Um, or there's some type of manufacturing defect. But I found a, an exorbitant amount of complaints online about the blue tint. And the SIG 3Ks don't have that blue tint. So anyways, as far as coatings go, the Leica and the Zeiss come in at first place. The Revix come in at second place. The Vortex third. The SIG 3K come in at fourth and I had to put the 10K in last because maybe from a technical perspective, there's still the same edge to edge clarity. Um, however, I cannot ignore the fact that if you turn everything blue, it must also impact low light performance. So SIG 10K are a, a big loser in that category. I apologize. So. If we looked at the optics total as a whole, coming in at first place tied is the Zeiss and the Leica. Third place, the Revic Acura. Fourth place, Vortex Fury. SIG 3K in fifth place and SIG 10K in sixth place. Next, we're gonna look at viewing performance. So typically how I do viewing performance is I look at image crispness, low light performance, edge to edge clarity, chromatic aberration, focus and eye box, which I did. I then also go through and I rank all of those independently. There was such a strong correlation between those categories within the class and also the scores that I got on that class compared to the previous optics class that I'm just gonna get to the overall ranking. I'm not gonna go through all of those because I don't think it really adds any additional value. So coming in at first place, is the Zeiss Victory. Second place is the Geovid. I'm gonna be completely honest. That's a subjective opinion. I'm doing the best I can. I have noticed that my eyes tend to prefer the Zeiss color profile. So if you put a Zeiss and something else side by side, I'm gonna to tend to gravitate to the Zeiss, even if I don't know what optic it is. So I think for most people, the Leica and the Zeiss are gonna be on par, and after that, it's a matter of personal preference. Third place, I'm giving the Revix. Fourth place, Vortex Fury. Fifth place, the Sig Kilo 3K. And last place, the Sig uh, Kilo 10K. Now, we're gonna move on to the final class, which is range finding. And to some degree, and probably clearly, is the most important class, because you are not buying range finding binoculars for their viewing performance or their optical clarity. You're buying range finding binoculars for their ranging capabilities first, their optical performance second. And I'm gonna get into the type of questions you should ask yourself when buying a range finding binocular as I get into my final recommendations. But let's get through this last section. So user interface, this was really very simple. The SIG 10K has a remarkably better user interface than the rest of them. So when you go into the menu option in the SIG 10K, you're given this like list and you can tab into each list item and it opens up as a tree and you can change everything. It's written in full words. It's very visible. It's easy to read. It made perfect sense. I didn't need to be looking at a manual at the same time. So it gets first place. All the rest of these tie for second place. The user interface is somewhat obtuse with all of these. I'm gonna be honest. Some of them like don't even use real letters. They're like half letters. 100% um, you need the owner's manual on your phone the first dozen or so times you use these because you will get lost within the menus and it's like, it is pretty complicated. Once you've been through it and like set things up a few times, 
it'll start to make more sense. And it's not like they're prohibitively poor, but it was just interesting to me how much better the SIG 10K was than all the rest. Moving on, we have integration. So this was my uh, attempt at assigning a score to how many other devices or the level to which you could integrate with these binoculars. So coming in at first place is the SIG Tilo 10K. It's got BDX 2.0. It has BDX for linking with Kestrel and Garmin devices. Also integrates with base map. So you can link waypoints on your map from where you range and it's the only binocular that does that on the table. Now, anecdotally, I have heard that there could be upwards of like a 200 yard variance between where it places the waypoint and where it actually shows up on your base map. So it's like, I, I'm not like, advocating you run out and buy the 10K because of that. I think there's some newer binos on the market that are just coming out this year that are gonna do that to like a 10 to 15 yard margin of error. And I think that's gonna be a bit game changing. Think about making a stock on an animal. Like you can literally range, drop a pin, open up your phone, pin is where the animal is, you can go make your stock. Like that to me starts to make the prospect of owning range finding binoculars, really interesting. The other thing to note is that the BDX 2.0 with the SIG Kilo 10K will let you Bluetooth link to the BDX scope and you can get holdover information on your scope from the binoculars. And to my knowledge, this is also the only um, binocular that does that. I was a little surprised because you have the Revic scope and the Revic binocular that Revic wasn't doing that. Maybe I was mistaken. I dug in and asked all the questions I could and I wasn't able to find that information anywhere. As far as I know, it's only the 10K that offers that capability. So second place is the Sig Kilo 3K. It does the Kestrel, the Garmin Fortrex, and it also does the BDX scope. Tied for third place is the Vortex Fury and the Leica Geovid because they link with both the Kestrel and the Garmin Fortrex. And then tied for fourth place is the Revic and the Zeiss. They don't link with anything except for the app. Now that's something I failed to mention, but all of these binos will Bluetooth link to their um, manufacturer's app on your phone. And that's where you can do some more advanced ballistic performance details, which I'll get into in a minute. But the Revic and the Zeiss don't link with anything else other than the app. Now I've heard some people complain that you can't use a Kestrel to input wind data into the Revic. And I've heard other people report retort that the wind data where you're standing is not nearly as important as your estimation of the wind data at several key points between you and your target. And you still can enter, you know, that information into the Revix just like you can with these other ones, but you cannot get wind information directly from a Kestrel with the Revix or the Zeiss. Now, responsiveness is the next class. And this was a combination of just, if I was doing a line of sight range, how fast and how reliable after I pressed that button was I getting a number? It's a combination of that and also the ballistic solver time. So when I started doing more advanced calculations where I was entering in ballistic performance data from a given bullet and I was doing an angle compensated range and I wanted an output in either holdover mills or MRADs, how long was it taking after I pressed the button for it to do the actual range and then estimate the uh, answer to the equation. Now, the Revix took first place pretty substantially. And I think it's one of the reasons why these have gotten so popular so quickly. And I know what people are talking about now. Like when you use the Revix, you look, you fire, you solve. Like it's like boom, boom, boom. And you're looking at data right away. And it's like every time with everything that you look at, it's really reliable and really fast. All of the rest of these kind of start to degrade a little bit as we go down the chain. So the Vortex Fury comes in at second place. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I was surprised at the performance of the Vortex Fury overall. I kind of tend to shit on Vortex a little bit, but for their price point, and I'll get into this later, um, 
I was quite surprised with the performance of, of the Furies. And then the SIG 3K, the Leica Geovid, the SIG 10K, and the Zeiss Victory RF are all going to tie for third place because they were all within the same general time frame to range and solve. We're going to look at accuracy, but really what I wanted to look at was beam divergence. So there is an actual uh, estimation uh, like in an area, like a a square area about the beam divergence over a given time frame. And you can kind of do this calculation to figure that out. I did. And I simply ranked these from best to worst in beam divergence. So coming in at the lowest, uh, so the best was the Revic Acura. It actually tied um, with the Sig Kilo 10K. Um, and then second place was the Vortex Fury. Third place was the Sig Kilo 3K. Fourth place was the Geovid. And fifth place was the Zeiss RF. And to give you an idea, the score of the first place was 0 0.09 divergence. And the score of the last place was 0 0.8. Eight. And then you have like 0.15s, 0.45s, 0.62s. Like there is a pretty substantial difference. Like I will say the Revic, the SIG 10K, and the Vortex Fury all have significantly lower divergence than the other three. Like you could almost break them into two categories, low divergence and high divergence. Now there are other elements of lasers that dictate the kind of quality of their performance, like power and other elements. So beam divergence is not the only characteristic you want to look at, but it is a meaningful data point. Now, max range is an unbelievably difficult thing to assess. And I went out and ranged things several different times. Here's the problem. Under different circumstances, these binoculars rank differently like on a cloudy day let's i'm just pulling numbers out because i don't have my notes as far as the actual each day that i did but for example the sigs might outperform the vortex on a cloudy day and then uh in rain the vortex might outperform the sig so when you're trying to assess like an overall max range i'm still a little bit lost because it, 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 there's so many different circumstances and environmental conditions you could run into. That being said, I did my best to average all the results along with a bunch of research that I did online. The SIG 10K are clearly the furthest. Like you can definitely range things the furthest away with the SIG 10K. Paired for second are the Revix and the Furies. The Zeiss and the Leica come in at third and the SIG 3K end up in fourth. But to be honest with you, I mean, they all shoot far enough that like for most people, that's not going to be the limiting factor. Like these things are going to shoot further than you should be shooting. I tell you that much for the vast majority of people. If you are some world-class sniper shooting out a mile, that's a different story. At that point, um, the, the limitations of these binoculars are going to start to become apparent. But for the average hunter, I really don't think you can, should consider max range as a significant part of your buying decision. The last note I want to make about range is there is a difference. Typically, binoculars will have three ways to measure their range. It is the distance they can range to a reflective surface, the distance they can relate, range to like a large non-reflective surface, like a concrete building or a mountain or a bunch of trees, and then the distance they can range to a deer. Or also think something like up on a skyline that's just like standing out because it has such a small area to bounce the laser information back from. Um, and so even if there are certain limitations with like ranging a deer, like it's not popping up at 1300 yards and I don't know, maybe you can take a 1300 yard shot. You can still, like when you're trying to estimate things or figure out how far things away, a lot of these will still range you know, mountains and buildings and, and cliffs and stuff, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 yards away. So they have incredibly useful um, lasers for that type of estimation, even if there's certain limitations when it comes to shooting, you know, a deer at 1,200 yards on a cloudy day. You might run into issues with almost all of these under 
that particular situation. And to be honest with you, that's a bad example. The conditions that tend to make it the most difficult are really bright, sunny days or thick fog. Um, and so you got to keep that in mind. Like you need to have a kind of shifting expectation about the range performance of all of these binoculars, given the conditions that you're in. Now, finally, the ballistic performance of all of these binoculars or how well they solve for ballistic equations. So let's start at number one. The Revic is a very interesting product because all of the rest of these except the Zeiss will allow you to access advanced ballistics or have a fairly advanced onboard solver or a combination of the both. Revic will not allow you to access advanced ballistic, but arguably has the most advanced solver of all of these. So um, three things that indicate a solver is highly advanced is that it takes into account Coriolis, which is the spin of the earth, like as the earth rotates, that's gonna impact where your bullet lands. Spin drift, the rotation of your bullet will impact its flight through the air and aerodynamic jump. And this has to do with the vertical axes of wind and how it is going to impact the vertical element of flight of your bullet over a distance. So as soon as you see a ballistic product, whether it be a rangefinder, an app, or a binocular that includes those three things, you can feel pretty secure. That's about as advanced a calculation as you're gonna get. And the Revic includes all of those. It does two different kinds of wind calculations if you want, based wind and vector wind. It has an incredibly intuitive app. It's standalone functionality without the app. So once you get a ballistic profile loaded, you don't need your phone. You can live right within your binocular. You do need to enter, manually enter wind data. Now, the only kind of uh, drawback of the Revix is that you can only load one ballistic profile at a time. Now, some people find that frustrating. Some people also like it because they can't mistakenly use another ballistics profile. Also, as a hunter, I only go hunting with one gun and one bullet at a time. So probably before I go on that hunt, I'm gonna load up that ballistic profile and that's all I'm gonna to need to worry about while I'm on that hunt. But let's say you were a guide and you had several clients with several guns, I could see an argument where you would wanna have more ballistic profiles and all of these other uh, binoculars store multiple ballistic profiles. Also to note, you can store multiple ballistic profiles on the phone and it is very fast, like two, three seconds, couple clicks, and you're loading up ballistic profiles. So not a deal breaker, but definitely something to consider. Tied for second place are the SIG 10K and the Vortex Fury. So the SIG 10K has applied ballistics elite software in the binocular, and the Vortex, you can pair it with the Fury app for ballistic mode, it has an applied ballistics onboard solver. And again, most of these have like compass, humidity, barometric pressure, temperature sensor, certainly the three that we've discussed so far. That would be another, you know, that would, it would set apart grades of range finding binoculars. If they don't have things like compass, barometric pressure, um, that right away puts them in that lower category. It's got, custom drop profiles, two wind modes, uh, stores up to three profiles on the binocular, the Vortex. Um, and you can use the Kestrel as an external solver or you can just use the wind from the Kestrel and keep the solving capabilities within the binocular itself. And like I said before, the Vortex really stood out to me here. It's a really a high value product considering it's only priced at 1500 bucks. Like a Geovid and the Zeiss Victory uh, pair for third place. So the Geovid has an internal ballistic solver unless you're connected to a Kestrel. You can do custom profiles, 12 preloaded profiles. Um, 
barometric, temperature, angle, all that kind of stuff. Zeiss Victory, same thing, but no wind input on the Zeiss Victory. You can't Bluetooth it to a Kestrel. Also, the Zeiss Victory does not account for Coriolis, spin drift, or aerodynamic jump. So it is a small step below the Leica Geovid, to be honest with you. So it's one point less. And then coming in at fourth place is the Sig Silo Kilo 3K. And the reason of that is that it comes with applied ballistics ultralight. So that's dumbed down to only doing calculations within 800 yards. So you cannot uh, solve for ballistic equations past 800 yards with the SIG Kilo 3K. Also, you need external um, environmental data. So a lot of these have those sensors on board. The SIG Kilo does not. Also only costs 800 bucks and that's you know probably why. So now if we look at the totals for the range finding performance, uh, the SIG Kilo 10K comes in first place with nine points. Second place is the Revic. Third place is the Vortex Fury. Tied for fourth place is the Leica and the Sig. And then last place is the Zeiss Victory RF. All right, let's go over the total scores. I'll tell you how all these rank against each other. And then I'll give you some buying recommendations for different budgets and different hunting styles. So coming in at first place with a score of 43 points is the Revic Acura. Coming in at second place with a score of 47 points is the Sig Kilo 10K. Third place with a score of 48 points is the Leica Geovid 3200. Tied for third place with 48 points is the Vortex Fury. Fourth place with a score of 50 points is the Zeiss Victory and fifth place with a score of 51 points is the Sig Kilo 3K. Now to put all that in context, we have a margin of discrepancy of about 12% between first place and last place. So it's not a huge discrepancy, but one of the biggest gaps in here is the gap between first place and second place. Like if we look at the score of first place is 43 points, second place is 47 points, so that's a four point discrepancy, so about a 10% discrepancy. When we go to the discrepancy between second place and last place, it's still only four points. So you basically have the same difference between the first binocular and the second binocular as you do between the second binocular and all the rest of the binoculars. So this is why I said the Revic stood out pretty clearly to me as a winner. Like it's like first place, and then everything else. There's a big jump between the second, third, fourth, and fifth. Now, some of you will remember a podcast I just did a few weeks ago when I got back from New Mexico, where I expressed some pretty you know, vocal opinions that I wasn't the biggest fan of these binoculars. And let me get into why. So that was an archery hunt. And this is gonna feed into some of my purchasing recommendations. Um, Range finding binoculars are not the ideal tool for an archery hunt. They're way too heavy. They do a bunch of stuff you don't need them to do. The glass quality isn't what it could be. It was also a very heavily glassing based hunt. I was in New Mexico. I was scouring the earth. It was, it was a really intense glassing hunt. And these are just, it's just not alpha glass. I have a hard time calling any of this stuff alpha glass when you compare it with true Zeiss Victory SF or Swarovski NL Pure. None of these are on par with that. Also, that's the problem with using something in isolation. Yes, the hunt before that one, I used a pair of uh, Zeiss SFLs and the 10 by 40s. And that was probably one of my most favorite binoculars I'd ever used. So I went from just using them as an optical tool, going from the Zeiss SFL to the Revic was a very sharp decline in optical performance. And it got significantly heavier, which is a big problem when you're trying to glass with a single hand and hold your bow in the other hand. But when I came home and went back to viewing these 
in comparison with all these other ones, instantly I was like, I mean, any of the problems that I have with the optics in this binocular are at least equal or greater with almost the rest of these binoculars. Like they, I have no problem saying that compared to what's on the market right now for range finding binoculars, I would consider the Revix above average in optical performance and arguably the best binocular on the market for ranging and ballistic solving performance. So that then broaches us into the topic of like who should be buying range finding binoculars and which ones should you buy? I'm gonna make a pretty firm stance here that if you're not a diehard long distance shooter or you don't participate in some type of like PRS or other league, I don't think range finding binoculars should be your primary binocular. Now, if you have a bucket load of disposable income and you got a pair of NL Pures in the garage and you can switch back and forth between those and these depending on the hunt, or if you're going on a hunt where you're also gonna be carrying like a pair of SLC 15s because it's a truck hunt or a day hunt um, and you can have these on your chest, okay, I get it. But for a lot of people watching this video, you only have enough money for one pair of binoculars. And I am going to tell you, in my opinion, if you are not a diehard long distance shooter, I don't think a range finding binocular should be your primary binocular. I think you should get a high quality optic binocular and a decent range finder. Because here's the other thing, if you are shooting under 500 yards, I think you need a firm grasp of ballistics. I think you need to understand the basics of angle compensation. I think you need to understand how fast your bullet is moving and the type of momentum and kinetic energy it's gonna have when it smacks into your target. But I do not think you need to understand Coriolis. I do not think you need to understand uh, spin drift or aerodynamic jump. And you don't need tools that calculate that. That's the boat I'm in. I have no desire to shoot anything over 500 yards. At this point in my life, I don't possess the skill to shoot things over 500 yards. Not ethically. I know where my skill set lies. I kill shit 500 and in. To be brutally honest, the furthest thing I've ever shot was 330 yards. Um, and I've, I've killed my fair share of animals, but the, the places I hunt, I always end up pretty close. I mean, my main range finder is a Leupold TBR 1400. I think it was $200 or $300. I've had the thing for two years. It works perfectly for everything I need it to do. That being said, if you're somebody who's gonna be exploring, you know, longer distances and you want a tool, at $2,600, the Revix are the clear standout choice. Now, I would say if you want to save some money and you're not as concerned about, you're willing to take a little bit of degradation in glass quality and a little bit of degradation in ballistic solving and ranging capability, my next choice would be the Vortex Fury. I think at 1500 bucks, they hold their own optically, they hold their own ballistically, the warranty is unmatched. I know I'm hard on Vortex sometimes, but I, this is one of the rare products that for me, also, this is the 5000 AB. This new version has environmental sensors on board. And if you go back to the original Furies, it didn't. And I think the jump in performance between the first gen Vortex Fury and the second gen Vortex Fury is a significant jump. So, now, here's something I'm gonna say that might be a surprise. If you have limitless funds, don't buy the Victory RF. For $4,000, they're just not worth it. The laser's not good enough, the ballistic solving capability's not good enough. The glass is the best glass here, but not for four grand, man. It's just, it doesn't make any sense. Now, the GeoVids at $2,600 currently I think you could make a strong case for that. But if you put for me, the Revic and the GeoVids side by side, and you want a binocular 
where you're prioritizing ballistic solving performance, I go with the Revic. But if you're going to be one of those under 500 guys, but you're a diehard rifle guy and you just want to be able to range, I would buy the GeoVids because the GeoVid optical performance is significantly better than the optical performance in the Revic for about the same price. Also, the Leica now has a new version, the GeoVid Pro, which I think, I couldn't include them here, but I think it would have had an impact in the rankings. Now, finally, I don't recommend buying the Suoro EL range. I have never used them. A really good buddy of mine bought them and returned them with inside of a month. He didn't like them at all. Everybody I know personally that have had those binoculars does not like them. And I know they're kind of looked at as the best in class, but they're $4,000 as well. So it's like, you can have a lot more binocular for four grand, man. Um, and you can have a much superior ballistic solving capability. So real simple here for me, 99% of people who want range finding binoculars and you know my opinions on who should run them and who shouldn't, I think the Revic are currently the answer. I This is one of the spaces I'm most excited about moving forward because I think there is a ton of new development and technology coming online for this specific product category. And I think we're gonna see huge leaps forward. Okay, now what everybody wants to know about, the raffle. Do you wanna win a brand new pair of Revic binoculars? Only 150 tickets, only 25 USD per ticket. You can buy as many tickets as you want. So do you go to mindful-reviews.com you need to be a member. You can join up there. As soon as you access the community, you're going to be given a link to where you can go buy raffle tickets. Raffle will stay live for either two weeks or until we sell out. Check the description of this video. Check the description on the website. If it says sold out, there are no more tickets available. So, as always, um, <laughs> this was kind of insane. Again, I apologize if I made any mistakes. I apologize if I didn't include something that you want included. I will never do six range finding binoculars again because I don't feel like I got into the depth that I like to with each of them. I think from now on with something like a range finding binocular, we do a head to head. Like I think taking the, the Fury and the Revic head to head is a really interesting comparison because one is significantly cheaper, one has significantly more features, and I could really dig into like the laser capabilities and the ballistic solving capabilities, and that could facilitate a really engaging conversation and review, but I will never do, <laughs> this took well over two months. Like if you knew how many man hours I had into this review, you would find it shocking, it's insane. But I'm super proud of what I was able to put out here if you like what I do, you wanna support what I do, you appreciate having unbiased, non-sponsored reviews, please, mindful-reviews.com, come and join up. It's a fantastic community with a lot of really great people. Um, forums are kicking off, it's, it's awesome. So that's that, here's another review. Up next, I'm gonna be doing my Prime review and raffle for the Prime RVX 34. I'm hoping to have that done in about two to three weeks. Also, if you're at Wild Sheep Society of BC's Mountain Hunting Expo in Penticton on February 23rd and 24th, come and see me. I'll have a booth and I'm doing a seminar on solo hunting on Saturday the 24th at 10 a.m. I will also be at the Western Hunt Expo all day Friday, just flying down for the day, going to walk around, try and meet as many people as I can. So there you have it. As always, thank you for tuning in.